Amen. Today's gospel is not what we expect to hear from Jesus. We expect parables that tell us about a man who had two sons, or a woman kneading yeast into dough, or seeds being sown, or a king giving a banquet. We expect parables that tell us about some ordinary point in life that suddenly reveals the kingdom of God, but not today. Or there's the teaching that guides us in daily life. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Judge not that ye be not judged. Love God, love your neighbor. What Jesus teaches challenges us, but it still is rooted in the ordinary round of family and community, responsibility and opportunity that we see in ordinary life but not in today's passage. This strange, deserving gospel places us in Jerusalem in the very last days of Jesus' teaching, where after the triumphant entry, just hours, if not days, from the Last Supper, when he says, friend will betray friend, Judas is standing there, and already the plot is in action. He's been teaching in the temple, facing trip facing questions that were traps and being able to speak through them and to open new understandings. He's resisted. He's welcomed those who are outcast. He's baffled his followers but given them some hope that they continue with him. That's where this gospel stands within the larger structure of what Luke is doing. We hear it on this Sunday because the church year is turning us towards Advent. We hear it in context of that wonderful vision from Isaiah of God's kingdom and its beauty and its fullness. And we know that we are not there yet. And this gospel points to the transition from this world to God's kingdom. The last weeks of the year, the last moments of Jesus' ministry, that's the context in which this gospel passage unfolds. But what about our life and where we stand? Jesus is talking to people who stand between destruction and hope, between destruction and the confusion of false hope. He points to a time of world-shattering destruction, the temple, massive and beautiful, the focus and center of his people's prayer and identity, glittering in the Jerusalem sunlight with brilliant lamps that break the darkness of the night, that temple would be destroyed. The first thing you need to know is Jesus did not say this with the fiery eyes of some crazed brimstone preacher yearning to see someone else destroyed. Luke's gospel begins with Zechariah offering incense in the Holy of Holies, and it will end when the disciples are back in the temple praising God after the ascension. Jesus speaks as a child of the temple. When we hear the story of its destruction, we have to recognize that that is as much a catastrophe as the rest of this passage. The temple will, under the force of invading empire, fall. Not a stone left on stone. What do you do when God's own home and the center of your people's identity is laid waste? What do you do when the world turns and suddenly nothing is as it was what you knew is unended. And what do you do when there's some compelling, convincing person, a program or an ideology that seems to make everything better? What do you do when there's such a groundswell of optimism and focus on some person's teaching, on some new plan? We have found the answer. Here's the one. False teachers who get close enough to the truth to be convincing and the thoughtless adulation that eases my anxiety by focus on some champion, here's the Christ. No, there he is. The deceptive danger is as sure a danger as is the obvious one. When the temple lies in ruins, and someone stands up and says, the time is near, and I can get you through it, what does Jesus ask us to do? Jesus calls for remarkable level-headedness. Most of us can react with panic or ill-placed enthusiasm in about a minute. We think it's time to despair, 
or we clutch at some straw that we think is the shelter we need, but to stand still, to let our trust in God make us patient, to let hope face destruction, and to let discernment read the signs of the times accurately, that doesn't come as naturally as either panic or gullible enthusiasm. So how do we build trust in God that can endure the earthquake and a sharp eye that can listen, really listen and see and sort through the noise and the confusion to know what really needs our attention? Listen again to the colic we started this Mass with. Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. Wonderful phrases that Thomas Cranmer gave us and we've prayed all these years since. Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. Not least, so that we can face collapse or glittering promise, neither shaken nor unduly enthralled. The call it asks us to pay such attention to Scripture that hope can take root and grow in us. Temples do fall. Great leaders and false teachers, prophets and charlatans arise. How do we respond? What strength of soul do we bring to this moment or to tomorrow's challenge? What have we read? Where have we marked, learned, and taken into our being what will give us hope? Obviously, I'm here and I speak as a stranger and a guest, but as a guest with you during your transition, I can say this, nothing will be so productive, nothing will leave this parish and each of you so ready for your next rector to come and lead you than this, to pray and ponder scripture long enough and regularly enough with as enough focus that your embrace on hope is stronger, your mind is more focused on Christ, his grace and his call. Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest and hold fast to hope. How else can we stand calm and resolute? How can we else can we read the signs of the times accurately and know what to ignore and what needs our attention? This strange, disturbing passage with the world's collapse ends more or less as it begins. When the temple and the world it represents lies in rubble, when false promise and hollow hopes arise, you need to hold your center and stand unmoved by panic or by deluded enthusiasm. And when the challenge is not collapsing worlds or clever charlatans, but rather something aimed more directly at yourself, we still don't get to panic. We don't even get to walk around ready to give quick, sharp put-downs are slashing witty remarks. Make up your minds not to prepare your defense. That language echoes Jesus' instructions when he sends the disciples out two by two on their first missionary journey. He says, don't take money, don't take a staff, don't take a second pair of shoes. He does send us out dependent upon his grace and his presence. Here he says, don't prepare your defense. I will give you a word and a wisdom. We're back once more to a life of disciplined prayer and deep familiarity with Scripture. We're called to live day by day open to hearing Christ's word so that we have a word. Is there an irony that I preach on this text from a prepared, that I preach on this passage from a prepared text? I don't think Jesus is encouraging us to face the world unprepared and without thought. Reading takes some facility with language, so too does speaking the truth. So I'm not sure that time spent thinking and rewriting is the problem. We are not meant to live, though, in anxiety and fear, always fretting about how we are faced this challenge or the other, always trying to find the clever answer that will shut down someone else. Discipline, which is pretty close to disciple, that is what Jesus calls us to make the mark of our life. When I search for the clever put-down or the verbal attack, the ver verbal attack that hits the mark, 
that is not me trusting God, but that's me trying to be my own defender. And here, Jesus calls us to be thoughtful, attentive, centered, and ready to speak clearly, honestly, and without fear. And here, I will point outside the church and to our communities and nation. We don't need more prepared arguments, probably, but we need to listen deeply and carefully. We need to speak our understanding as clearly as we can, but with as much humility as with determination. We live and we serve Christ within the reality of time, where we have to wait for God's kingdom, where we have to speak and act and work for what is right and good, sometimes in the face of opposition. We have to work for what heals the brokenhearted and feeds the hungry when there's so many other claims and so many other voices speaking loudly. Temples fall and false hopes arise. There are those who persecute and betray and those who endure such things. We need to know where Christ calls us to stand. And so, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest so that you can hold fast the blessed hope. The passage ends, so your endurance, by your endurance you will gain your soul. Older translations of that last verse are perhaps, in my mind, more memorable. Possess ye your souls in patience. Possess your soul in patience. To endure, well, that is what we're called to do in the face of collapse, false hopes, and personal attacks. Still, there is more here than just sticking it out. We're not meant to passively walk through suffering. The reason patience might be a better word, is that it suggests that we might be going through a rough, a dangerous time, but we are looking, we're waiting, we're walking towards something else. Patience implies a focus on the future, where God's kingdom, and the beauty that Isaiah describes, and the fullness of human flourishing that Isaiah sings of, where all these dangers are past and where Christ's presence is known. Christian faith points us to a future. Our faith will always point us back more deeply to this moment, to the work that we are called to do now, to the goodness that we're supposed to see around us and offer to those around us. But Christian faith always sees past this moment, whatever the moment is, even if it's the collapse of the world. We see past it to the world God intends there to be. Possess ye your souls in patience, because we stand calm and centered in upheaval. While we wait and work, rejoice or grieve, plant and harvest, or even face drought and emptiness, through all of that, God is working. There is a blessed hope for us to embrace. And that gives strength to live with each other in patience, in witness to what is true and good, ready to serve, swift to stand with those in need, and always mindful that God's promise and God's kingdom will stand. Amen.